Hello, I am Deb LaMarche, my colleague Shannon Christensen, and I would like to welcome you to the latest presentation in the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers webinar series. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. These webinars are typically presented on the third Thursday of each month. Located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national TRCs, one focused on telehealth policy and the other on technical assessment. We all serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. A few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted. To ask questions, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. For technical assistance during the webinar, please use the chat function. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to access today's and past webinars on the National TRC YouTube channel. Today's webinar is hosted by the Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center and presented by Seattle Children's Hospital Autism Center. It is my, ple uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yanis Padilla Dalmau. Dr. Dalmau is a licensed psychologist and board certified behavioral analyst at the doctoral level at the Bio Behavioral Program and the Pediatric Feeding Program at Seattle Children's Autism Center. In these programs, she uses applied behavior analysis methodologies to assess and treat individuals with autism and related developmental disorders who engage in challenging behaviors or who have significant feeding disorders. In addition, Dr. Padilla Dalmau is a leader in the telehealth arm of these programs, which allows for expanded behavior analytic services. She has been author or co-author on several peer-reviewed publications in the area of behavioral treatments and in the use of telehealth in the delivery of these services. Please welcome Dr. Padilla Dalmau. Thank you, Deb. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar. Um, as Deb mentioned, I work at the Seattle Children's Hospital Autism Center in both the biobehavioral and the pediatric feeding programs. And within both of these programs, we use the science of applied behavior analysis, or ABA for short, to assess behavioral concerns and to develop function-based interventions. I was recruited by the directors of both of these programs to increase access to their programs, in part by expanding their services through the use of telehealth. Uh, starting in about 2008, I was involved in research at the University of Iowa, and we, in which we attempted to evaluate the effectiveness of behavioral assessment and behavioral intervention for children who had significant challenge in behavior through telehealth. And since then, I've worked on translating this research into practice in Virginia first at a private nonprofit ABA agency, and now in Washington at the Seattle Children's Autism Center where our teams are conducting various telehealth projects within a larger hospital system. And I should add for this audience that although I've used telehealth in multiple contexts as it pertains to ABA, I consider myself a, an expert in behavior analysis and severe challenge in behavior, and I have been fortunate enough to use telehealth technology to support our patients and their families in innovative ways. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share this work with you today. So Deb, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, objectives will be first to give you a brief description of ABA and our biobehavioral program model so you understand what we do in person. And I'd like to share why we decided to use telehealth for this population and for this service modality. We'll discuss a little bit of the supporting research and describe how we've translated this research into practice at Seattle Children's Autism Center and give you a few of our preliminary outcomes because this project is still ongoing. Um, we'd also like to share some lessons learned and considerations for practice for both clinicians looking to do this work with ABA and those of you supporting the clinicians within larger systems. We're describing just ABA and our program. 
process is a science in which we apply behavioral principles to socially important behaviors across natural contexts like homes, schools, and businesses. A large portion of our research base has focused on improving the lives for, of individuals with developmental and intellectual uh, disabilities, including autism. Uh, and the service, service models geared towards this population can be broadly defined as either comprehensive in nature or focused approaches. And it really depends on the goals of the treatment. Both of these models have extensive research support. And briefly to describe these models, the comprehensive model focuses on teaching skills across a variety of areas such as communication, daily living skills, social skills, academic skills, among many others to improve long-term outcomes for individuals. And this comprehensive service model is often delivered for extended periods of time, uh, as many as many years. Uh, the staffing model for, uh, for this model includes having behavior technicians implement treatment under the supervision of a behavior analyst like myself. And the technicians can see patients in the home, schools, or centers, and the BCBA supervises for a portion of those hours per week. Focused models of ABA generally are more short-term and they address specific behavioral concerns such as self-injurious behavior, significant aggression, property destruction, PICA, among other challenging behaviors. Our patients typically carry diagnosis uh, such as stereotypic movement disorder with self-injurious behavior or disruptive behavior disorders. For this focus model, the behavior analyst often implements the procedures themselves or provides much higher level of supervision given the severity and acuity of these concerns. Excuse me, this slide still want to move forward. Okay, so the biobehavioral program um, at Seattle Children's Autism Center uses a focus model of ABA uh, to assess and treat children with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have severe challenging behavior. And clinical psychologists like myself who are also board certified behavior analysts and also master's level behavior analysts conduct the assessments and treatments. We have uh, an interdisciplinary clinic that we staff with clinical psychologists, a speech and language pathologist, a pediatric psychiatrist, and these clinics are, the focus of them are to determine the appropriate treatment track for patients within our programs. And our psychologists also conduct intakes individually for patients who don't need the full team. We have three treatment tracks, which I present here from the most to least intensity. The intensive outpatient track is a two-week admission during which children and their families come to clinic two hours per day. Um, and the functional behavior assessment track in which we see patients twice per week for one hour each time. We have our consultation track when we see the parents or the patients once per week for 13 visits. And in addition, we see families sometimes for booster sessions for follow-up as needed. In all of these tracks, we implement functional behavior assessment procedures of different complexities to determine what are the environmental variables that are controlling the children's challenging behavior. So basically we try to figure out why are these behaviors occurring and we then determine function-based treatment strategies, strategies to decrease these challenging behaviors and increase adaptive behaviors. We typically in person have caregivers conduct most of these sessions with bug in the ear technology and coaching from us. So parents are typically implementing all the assessment and intervention procedures here anyways. Um, we collect extensive observational data during assessment and intervention, and we often record our sessions uh, for review later. Let's move to talk a little bit about why we decided to add telehealth to our service models. Nation may be old hat for many of you already embedded in telehealth, but um, in order to propose these new service models, these were really important issues for us. So we know that research in many areas of healthcare have shown there are great benefits to the use of telehealth. It improves access to providers uh, for people who are in remote locations. Second, 
It has been shown to increase cost effectiveness and efficiency, such by reducing travel time for families. In addition, our programs are always motivated to consider innovative models to improve quality of our services. And some research has shown that the quality of services delivered through telehealth are often equal to in-person. And in some cases, telehealth can actually improve the quality of services. Finally, there is a high patient need and demand for services delivered through telehealth. And specifically in ABA, there are just not enough behavior analysts to deliver services for all children with autism in person. The majority of the behavior analysts are located typically in major cities, leaving clients who need ABA services and live in rural areas without access to services. So for example, here you have the number of BCBAs and BCABAs and the estimated percentage of children with autism receiving ABA services in, the, in our region, in the states in our region. The number of providers is current um, from this year, but the estimate of ABA services is about five years old, so I'm sure it's changed, but it, it gives you an idea of the relative percentages in the WAMI region, and you'll note that Washington has a high number of providers, but only 21% of children were receiving ABA services, which was under the national average. Um, and then obviously the scenario is wor worse in the rest of the states where the estimated delivery of ABA ranges between zero to 19%. So this is kind of like a macro level view at access in our region, uh, but I have seen similar patterns of access in Iowa and in Virginia. So in Washington, we're looking at about 12,000 children diagnosed with autism and very few providers with expertise in specialty treatment services and diagnostic services. Most centers of excellence typically provide diagnostic diagnostic services, but not robust treatment programs under the same roof. And there's just lack of providers that deliver these services to patients um, with Medicaid. In relation to our programs, there's a dearth of providers with expertise and tools to deliver specialty treatment services and apply behavior analytic focused assessment and intervention um, for children with severe challenging behaviors and also with pediatric feeding disorders. So at Seattle Children's Autism Center, we see a large portion of the children diagnosed with autism in the state of Washington. And we're one of the largest uh, autism centers in the country. During the last year alone, we saw over 4,000 unique patients and over 21,000 individual visits. We receive referrals from all over our state and out of state. However, we have a pretty high cancellation rate from our patients in remote and rural areas and counties. Above, we have just the, the referrals for about two years for the entire autism center, which includes diagnostics, medication management, treatment visits, and all of our other services. You'll note that there is a wide spread of referrals across the state. Above, I'm showing uh, the lifetime referrals for individual patients for the biobehavioral program in the state of Washington from 2012 to 2018. So this includes all the children who have been referred to our program who are engaging in significant challenging behavior across the state, which gives you a good estimation of the need across the state for these services. Um, in our program though, we also struggle with high cancellation rates. And one recent estimate um, was that about 37% of our visits um, are canceled. There are obstacles for our families that come from a distance to access autism services despite needing them. Like I mentioned, there are limited providers in their area, um, especially ones that accept Medicaid. They also have to travel very long distances to Seattle, which can be hazardous due to travel conditions. For example, I have a family that I saw from Wenatchee, which is a town over the mountains to east of Seattle, who had to travel over the mountain pass and often had to turn around due to poor conditions and snow. Um, in addition to challenging behavior, um, the challenging behavior makes it very difficult to travel long distances. Um, for example, I had a patient who persistently tried to pull out her NG tube when in the car driving to see me to work on pulling her G tube. So she had to stop on the side of the road to avoid um, having her child aspirate and the young lady then went hours without nutrition because of this behavior to come treat it. Um, I had another family with a 16 year old who 
with severe aggression who lived around the Deception Pass, Mount Vernon area, uh, which is two hours north of Seattle. And they had to stop multiple times on the way here because he was punching the windows on their van, punching the mom that was driving. Um, and they'd come to see me for their one hour to work on these behaviors. And then they'd have to get back in the car with him upset two hours north. Um, so other than these difficulties, these kids are missing their local services that are hard fought sometimes. And some of these patients, if they're coming to see me twice a week, they're missing two entire days of school and therapies for three to four months to receive my service. So in addition to the very compelling reasons for expanding our services to telemedicine, there have also been previous studies in ABA demonstrating that focused ABA um, for specific for challenging behavior, um, such as functional analysis, uh, behavioral interventions like functional communication training can be conducted effectively with high integrity, with high parent acceptability, and at lower cost than in-person service delivery, through typically through the use of synchronous telehealth technology. In addition, the research has shown that parents and behavioral technicians can be taught how to implement these procedures through telehealth remotely without somebody needing to be with them in their home. Uh, Dr. David Wacker and his team at the University of Iowa have pioneered the implementation of focused ABA for severe challenging behavior through telehealth, and I was fortunate enough to be part of that team. Across my career delivering ABA through telehealth, we've used various service models. The first can be described as the parent or caregiver coaching model, where the provider coaches the parent remotely to implement assessment intervention. And this can be done uh, when a family is in a clinic, so a telehealth clinic to clinic or clinic to home. And I typically use this model for uh, the focus model of ABA, so short term and focus on a specific behavioral concern. When I worked at a private nonprofit, we were able to use the supervision model for the comprehensive ABA type of treatment. So in this model, the BCBA supervised the in-home technicians to conduct therapy remotely. Today, we're just gonna focus on the parent coaching model, which is what we're utilizing at the biobehavioral program. And also, it matches the research that uh, was conducted at the University of Iowa. In 2008, the Iowa team started uh, a series of research studies to evaluate if we could do this, conduct behavioral assessments and treatment through telehealth, replicating the work that Dr. Wacker and his colleagues had done in person effectively for 20 years in families' homes, for having families like implement the assessments and interventions. In our telehealth project, we worked with young children who were diagnosed with autism and were engaging in challenging behavior. The parents were always the therapists and conducted all the procedures, and they received life coaching by a trained behavior consultant. The consultants were in the University of Iowa um, in a telehealth lab, as shown here. And in the first research grant, the parents went to a local clinic, and we had a parent assistant in the clinic room to help as needed. And this setup is depicted above with the parent assistant in here in the corner and the parent and the child on the floor doing the assessment with my coaching. In um, subsequent grants, the parents were coached directly in the home without an assistant present. And these models showed equivalent reductions in problem behavior, similar acceptability, decreased costs, and increased consultant time to see additional clients. So I could see a lot more patients without having to drive five hours to a family's home or three hours to a family's home. I incorporated both of these models um, into the Seattle Children's Autism Center within our hospital system using a fee-for-service model. I'll go now through and compare kind of the research model and the models we're implementing here in practice. And I'll go into detail into some of the procedural steps we took to ensure the safety of our patients and to integrate the service lines within our existing systems. Okay, so we first started with the clinic to clinic model late in 2016. We already had a network of established Seattle Children's Regional Clinics. Um, there was already a mechanism for scheduling these visits within our EHR, um, and there was an existing billing structure for telemedicine visits to our regional clinics. In addition, all of our providers had privileges at these clinics as they were part of our network. 
all of our clinics were equipped with video teleconferencing hardware and ran telemedicine visits with other departments in the hospital. However, given the nature of our patients' challenging behavior, we conducted prior screening of each clinical space. So even though there were established clinics with our hospital, we did a pre-screening for our specific patients. Prior to starting our patients, um, I scheduled a visit with the clinic's nurse manager to review the process for checking in patients. Um, for example, some of our pa patients don't tolerate um, getting their blood pressure done, so we kind of talked about the check-in process. Um, we also reviewed the clinical space for uh, sharp corners, breakable items, uh, possible items, medical supplies that could be thrown, and any vulnerable equipment. Um, so we decided which clinic room to use depending on those criteria. And for example, in one clinic room, uh, there were some sharp corners in a desk, so we just sent them cover protectors so that that room could be prepped and ready for um, all of our patients. So in the autism center, we have a mobile cart, which you can see here to the right. Originally, it was equipped with life-size VTC, and now it's equipped with Cisco VTC to match our hospital-wide um, changes. We also had a stationary VTC that we could use in a conference room, but so far, um, we've utilized this cart the most. We um, added the cart to our scheduling processes so that it is checked out as any other clinical room, um, and that way we can document usage and availability. While implementing this model, we also developed a process for screening the patients uh, to make sure that they were clinically appropriate for telehealth. We also developed a process for ensuring that we checked insurance to make sure that they had the telemedicine benefit. And then for scheduling rooms in both the originating site and remote locations. And finally, scheduling the visit in Epic. So this process has been highly iterative and has many, many, uh, changed many, many times as we identify challenges in the system and with feedback from all of our resources. Um, so one of the biggest differences between the research model and our clinic-to-clinic -clinic model has been an expansion of the target population and concerns. So we're seeing children with developmental disabilities and challenging behavior of any age. Uh, for example, I, I have seen children that are up to age 13 in the clinic, and we're seeing patients also in our pediatric feeding program who have severe feeding concerns. Within our biobehavioral program, we have seen children across all of our standard once per week and twice per week outpatient models. However, we've also been able to leverage telehealth to have follow-up visits for patient who, patients who don't see us regularly and it's hard for them to travel. And we've also been able to conduct the pre and post visits for the families who uh, go through intensive admissions. And these are our most severe patients. So traveling for a one hour appointment is the most difficult for them. In our regional clinics, the parent was always present with a child in the clinic room and they received all the coaching directly. Uh, there were medical assistants and nurses who checked them in and took any vitals that were needed. And they emailed us any materials such as data records, um, data sheets, anything like that. However, differently than in our research, the, um, the MAs and the nurses did not stay in the room. So once they, um, I logged in, they left the parents and the children uh, in the room with, for my coaching. For this clinic-to-clinic -clinic model, we were able to have three uh, psychologists and behavior analysts, in addition to our registered dietitian uh, for our feeding program. For the biobehavioral program, it was only the two psychologists that uh, ran the sessions. And these here are the regional clinics in relation to the referrals we receive across the autism center. And as you see, we have some areas the areas with the most referrals covered with the current clinics. However, there were many families, particularly in the peninsula to the left, in the Bellingham area to the north, and Whatcom and Skagit counties, and Yakima and other areas that did not have a, a close regional clinic. So this is why even though the clinic to clinic model was a very important step, we really wanted to pursue the in-home services to make our services accessible to all families who would benefit from this service modality. So in Iowa, the Clinic to Home Research Grant, we started it right after the Clinic to Clinic project when it showed effectiveness. Um, and the major differences obviously were the originating site, so the child was at home, 
and the technology. The families, they were sent equipment paid for by the grant, right, um, including laptops and webcams, and they had a lending pool to check, check out this technology. Um, the Iowa project, like I mentioned, found similarly effective treatments in between in-person, clinic to clinic, and clinic to home, and families found all modalities appropriate. At the Autism Center, we would have loved to begin with the clinic to home to be able to reach families in their natural environment. However, when we started our programs in 2016, the home wasn't an authorized originating site, so this limited our ability to expand to the home with a fee-for-service model. However, the law changed in January of 2018 in Washington State, adding the home as an originating site. So by April, we were piloting our in-home telehealth program. So really, we were um, really wanting to start this model. So piloting an in-home project was identified as a strategy from the hospital to increase access to care and, uh, and to increase patient and provider satisfaction. To be successful, telehealth was integrated within our existing um, electronic health record scheduling and billing system and um, a large project team from various sectors of the hospital chose our project at the autism center to start the first direct -to consumer model within the entire hospital therefore we had much more support implementing this innovative model it was a very iter iterative process but the iterations didn't depend only from our clinicians but rather from an entire support team which made this much more nimble um, the project was sponsored at the hospital executive level by the chief medical officer and the senior vice president, and the integrated delivery team consisted of representatives from the Autism Center, Access, IT, Cerner and Epic, Revenue Cycle, Marketing, and many, many others, including patient experience, which was really important for us. The team was pulled together to have one representative from each area to allow us to work quickly and nimbly and each person was responsible for their subject area. For our in-home program, we saw patients in their homes, obviously, but we were also able to see them in their schools. And we often had parents, for example, call in from work so they could observe and continue learning while their spouse was implementing treatment at home. Or we sometimes had nannies or caregivers run the treatment at homes and then parents could observe remotely. As far as the family's experience with technology, we have used uh, family's own equipment and internet for now. We use the Blue Jeans application where the hospital had a BAA with already. The families received automated emails when they had an appointment scheduled through the, their MyChart, and they had to log on to MyChart to access it. This process was very cumbersome for families, so recently uh, our team eliminated the requirement of MyChart, and families are receiving uh, emails to their visits directly to their email. To do this, we internally developed the functionality to email the patient's information to virtually connect to the appointment instead of having to sign up for MyChart. And this development work is fairly unique in direct-to-consumer programs and we're very proud of it. On the provider side, we were using desktop computers or iPads with the BlueJeans applications and providers were now able to see patients from their own desks without having to leave their office. Our hospital team really wanted to equip providers with hardware um, that they wanted to use and they, um, they wanted to be what they call device agnostic. So for example, one of our providers really liked to use the iPad, but I, we prefer using a desktop PC with two screens since I need to see the patient on one side and be able to code data on the other screen. At this point, really, any tablet, laptop, or desktop that the provider prefers will work for this model. Um, the development team also created functionality for providers to stay in their uh, native workflow in their EHR and launch the video visits from our schedule viewer. So you see your patient in your schedule, you just click on it. They build a little icon that is gray or dithered and it turns blue and clickable um, when the patient is connected to their video visit. As providers, we were very excited about this functionality and this eliminated many provider errors and worries about technology and it systematized the use of telehealth in the home within our existing workflow. I also should add that our development, development team created this functionality within a few months and are constantly updating any glitches in real time during this pilot. As far as the kids we saw in the home, our population was the same uh, children with challenging behavior and feeding disorders that we saw in the clinics and that we see in person. 
However, we established an additional structured screening process and safety assessment for the home. We modified that screener we created for the clinic to clinic and added more detailed questions about safety based on uh, best practices. So here's the first page of the screener. This may look a little small on some screens, um, but it includes questions for both clinic to clinic and clinic to home. We asked them some demographic questions and very importantly for the in-home project, uh, whether they had internet connected devices and at the beginning if they signed up for MyChart. After these technical questions, we went through safety screener where we asked about their ability to manage their child's behavior without needing assistance. And we then had a summary of the screener for the provider and a clinical tool to decide whether the patient was appropriate for telemedicine in the clinic or in the home and whether a referral should be made. In the bottom part of the screener, we modified Kathleen Meyer's care protocol, which includes important safety questions, privacy questions, and um, possible safety concerns, crisis resources, and these screeners had to be available to all providers during all subsequent telemed visits in case of emergency. The screeners were done before scheduling any patient visit in the home. So in addition to screening the patients clinically before we scheduled the visits, we also developed a structured way to evaluate the clinical space, uh, safety and quality during the first and subsequent visits for both the biobehavioral program and the feeding program. In particular, we wanted to evaluate the general safety of the home, identify a safe space for the visits. We needed to sterilize or modify the space, which helps with our clinical assessments. Um, which are very precise and requiring, require manipulating environmental variables carefully. We wanted to establish uh, quality audiovisual, of course, and then determine the best way to communicate with the parents. So as you can see, uh, we outlined some tasks for the provider that match each goal so that they can meet the goals during that visit. And we provided guided questions and things to think about as they were conducting the assessment of the space and we iteratively evaluate safety during all visits. Another difference for this project in the home was that we were able to extend our coaching and consultation, not just to the parents, but additional caregivers, teachers, teaching assistants, and importantly for us, since we're a short-term program for children who will need longer-term needs, we were able to transfer care and discharge to local behavior analysts who otherwise would not have been able to travel to Seattle to transfer and coordinate care. And like I've mentioned, similarly to the clinic to clinic model, there were two licensed psychologists and behavior analysts who conducted the sessions um, for the biobehavioral program. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about outcomes. Um, like I mentioned, these projects are still ongoing, but I've put together some of our quality clinical access and a little bit of our financial um, initial outcomes to share with you today. And I'm going to focus on the results for the biobehavioral program for the last two years. And as I mentioned before, we are also run, running these pilots with our pediatric feeding program, which also uses the ABA model. Our, the director of that program, Dr. Danielle Dolezal, will go into more detail about those feeding outcomes at the NRTRC conference in Utah at the end of October. Um, so for the biobehavioral program, the director of the program, Dr. Eric Bolter, and myself ran all the sessions, and I split my telehealth visits between both programs. So we saw these patients as part of our regular clinical caseloads when we embedded into our regular caseload. We saw four patients in the clinic and 10 in the home. In clinic, we completed 38 visits and in the home, 104 between the both of us. So this constitutes about 10 visits on average per patient, which you know, goes to show the high intensity and acuity of these patients' need. And here are the date ranges for these services. So it is important to know that we started the clinic to clinic model two years ago and in home only five months ago. And uh, this discrepancy I attribute, in my opinion, to a few things. One, after doing a few patients in the clinic, we were much more comfortable doing this and we really wanted to move to the home. As providers, we would prefer to see patients in the home if possible, where parents are actually gonna be implementing these treatments. And third, and I think really importantly, it demonstrates difference in institutional support that we had for both programs. So in the clinic to clinic program, we were piloting this project highly provider-led without much administrative support. 
In fact, for the first few patients, I was figuring out the scheduling and the processing myself. Um, however, for the, we had a large team supporting our efforts in the home, so we could really just focus on switching our kids to in-home and clinical practice uh, instead of the administrative and program details. As far as the type of service, we did one full consult admission, which is the 13 visits um, in clinic. This particular patient uh, had been admitted to the, an inpatient unit for a severe challenging behavior. Then she stepped down to see me twice a week for 24 visits. And then I gingerly transitioned her into her community uh, through telehealth in the, her regional clinic to stabilize her in her community. And the patient hasn't had to return to the ED or inpatient unit since. So kind of good news. We ran um, two consults in the home and one of those patients transferred. I was seeing them in home and this was very difficult for them. So we flipped to the home. Um, and one of our patients, we had had an intensive admission here, but the parents needed a lot of support generalizing the treatment. So we had 13 visits in their home after their two week intensive uh, to generalize uh, into their community. We did one functional behavior assessment in the clinic. Um, and this is the type of intensity that most replicates the research we did in Iowa, doing a functional analysis and um, treatment match to function. We had five of, this in, five of these in the home, but one of our participants had to stop treatment early due to medical complications unrelated to his behavior. Out of those five patients, two were step downs from the intensive models. We were also able to run a few novel types of visits through telehealth. In the clinic, we saw one patient for follow-up. In the home, we saw one patient for a medication evaluation um, in collaboration with a psychiatrist. And in the home, we also had a parent-only uh, consult. Finally, we had one patient in the clinic to clinic project who has his had his visits prior to intensive through telehealth. And this enabled that family to limit their travel time with a very challenging patient. And they only had to travel to Seattle when they were gonna stay here for two weeks for their intensive. This same patient was one of the ones that needed a full FBA sequence in their home after uh, through telehealth, after his intensive admission. Um, so that patient accessed telehealth before their intensive in clinic and then after their intensive in their home. We had one clinic to home patient who we saw after an intensive for just a few visits to again support the family during that transition and generalized treatment effects. So in summary, we were able to replicate the research models in practice, but we're also leveraging telehealth to come up with innovative ways to support our families who have intensive needs in different ways that our in-person models just do not, do not allow to help generalizing into the home and improving long-term outcomes. So for the in-home project, we developed a quality questionnaire and uh, we asked quality questions from the provider and patient. Um, on about 28% of the visit, we were able to collect these. And as you can see, um, from a Likert scale range from one to five, with five being highly satisfied. And the patients rated us at 4.66 and the providers rated it as 4.57. So pretty high acceptability. And we also had an open-ended question for families about what other benefits they feel the telehealth in-home visits had. Um, and you'll see one family stated that dad could keep his medical appointment, mom could attend a work conference, and the child didn't have to be in the car for six hours. And if you just read down the line, the theme is that um, these visits in the home are allowing them to access their communities more, lessen the burden of traveling to Seattle, and to be able to retain employment. Um, when we ask them, most of these families are happily and willingly, uh, they want to drive to Seattle if that's the only way they can get services because their children are engaging in severe challenging behavior. However, when asked, what would you prefer if the quality is the same, they prefer to stay in their home. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the referrals only for the severe um, behavior program on the left. Um, and next to it, we have the number of individual patients we were able to reach in their homes and the stars are our regional clinics. So at this point, with our telehealth capability, we could reach any of the patients um, in their home. And our next steps are working through some access barriers with families who don't have the hardware or internet services and also access barriers for non-English speaking families. So we keep plugging along to increase access. 
This map shows you the number of individual patients across the hospital and the autism center since we started direct to consumer in the hospital. And the important thing here in this map is that families have saved over 31,000 miles, which is equal to about $16,600 in mileage. So I also wanted to show you just the sheer volume of visit the autism center has done in telemedicine across the last two years, across all of our programs that are doing in-home telemed, which is biobehavioral, pediatric feeding, and medication management. And we've seen a steady increase in numbers of overall telehealth visits since we started our telehealth programs. In 2017, we only reached three clinics. And in 2018, we have accomplished reaching the home, the final frontier, and um, five regional clinics across the state. So one of the variables we were very interested in, as I mentioned at the beginning, was decreasing the no-show and cancellation rates of our biobehavioral patients. So here we have those data. No-shows for in-person were about 4% and cancellations 37%, as I mentioned. In clinic, clinic to clinic telehealth, we had zero no-shows and 7.7 .7 canceled. And in the home, we have 2% no-shows, so less than in-person, and 22.8 canceled, which is less than in-person, but not as much as we thought. So we are looking into the variables that could have resulted in this. Um, one piece that I should mention is that we have not had any uh, sessions canceled due to technology infrastructure or process fails. Um, so all of our visits have been completed successfully when the parents do show. And in regards to finance, we're closely monitoring our collection rate. And in Washington, we're very lucky to have a law that requires private payers and Medicaid to reimburse for telemedicine services in the home. So, so far what we've seen is that our private payers and Medicaid are paying us for professional fees about equal rate, and we will just continue monitoring this uh, as we move forward. So, we're still in the middle of these projects, but so far we're observing high satisfaction, quality and financial viability, and innovative models that we've been able to implement. But for this talk, I spoke with some of our team members and providers to tease apart what are our main lessons learned or considerations. And two themes emerge. One, implications and tips for practice for behavior analysts trying to translate ABA research to practice. And two, implications and lessons for teams trying to integrate a telehealth model into a hospital system. So let's start with considerations for the practice of ABA in particular, uh, translating what you read and research uh, to your own practice. And these considerations are for both providers in a small like, private practice agency or a larger system like a hospital system. So as I discuss those, the slides will refer to the BACD ethical codes that are pertinent to the area for those of you who are behavior analysts. And um, in practice, telehealth is in its infancy in behavior analysis. So I also have drawn uh, from the APA ethics code and the APA guidelines for practice of telepsychology when I'm thinking about issues and concerns that arise with telehealth. So the first aspect of telehealth and ABA you need to determine is the type of service model you're gonna use. This should largely depend on those service models that have some evidence or some research hacking. And in addition, you need to make sure that in order to have a sustainable practice, that the evidence-based model you selected is actually covered by your third-party payers or whatever funding source you're using. As behavior analysts, we're encouraged to be aware of our ethical obligations when we work with colleagues within our profession and from other professions. Um, and when we use telehealth, we're often reaching into different communities outside of our own. So this means we have to communicate and rely on colleagues in different areas. So in research, typically your grant collaborators have buy-in into your project and are uh, theoretically invested in making it work. Um, but with community partners, you have to identify what needs they have that you can meet in order to maintain that relationship long-term. So some tips for practice is identify partners with high interest and motivation. So we had some regional clinic partners that had higher ratio of children with ASD autism that they couldn't treat. So they were more, more, much more engaged, which makes sense. Um, I recommend identifying uh, community referral sources for your uh, target, for that target area. Community partners that can help you with care coordination and primary care, and community partners that you can refer to for other services. 
another initial consideration for practice is determining the criteria of the patients that you will see through telehealth and developing a system for determining whether the service modality is appropriate for each client. Most of these uh, practice steps come from personal practice, but also from the APA telepractice guidelines. So we recommend that you conduct safety screenings of the client site in the home, community, or clinic. And like I showed, we designed a structured safety evaluation of the home. We recommend establishing a criteria for clients to be seen remotely. For example, in Iowa, we had a criteria that the patients have to be within 50 miles of their regional clinic. And in children's, the criteria we established is that the child just has to live closer to one of the regional clinics than to the autism center. Um, we have no criteria for distance for in-home because sometimes it is appropriate when the patients live close by, but we need to generalize into the home to do it um, regardless of distance. Uh, we always recommend establishing a safety screener to evaluate the risk benefit uh, before you see the patient. Um, and I always recommend that you develop a standard screener that includes all of your decision-making pathways and processes so that all clients are screened in the same way for service, regardless of who's screening them. Obviously, have all the local emergency contacts and have those readily available for in-home and community locations, because you have to remember that if you call 911 from a landline, um, you won't go to that family's uh, police department and there may be a delay, there's an emergency. And then just continuously reevaluate safety um, and appropriate, appropriateness of the model for each patient. Our patients' behaviors fluctuate. They grow in size and uh, severity. Um, and the severity um, has to be evaluated continuously. So develop a process for reevaluating that continuously. So once you decide what your service model is, who your referral sources are, and other colleagues um, are, and who your clients will be, you need to determine how to train and credential your team. This was one of the biggest differences for me between research and practice, because when you write a grant, you can just select your research team and there aren't very many limits or credentialing required of them. However, in practice, your staff has to be credentialed according to state laws to practice and according to your third party payers and trained to the highest standard required. In addition, your institution may have specific rules about which providers can and cannot be credentialed to deliver services through telehealth. So you need to be very familiar with these institutional regulations before establishing your model. And when appropriate, you can challenge some of these uh, barriers and some of these preconceived notions internally. In terms of specific telehealth training, we must ensure that the people receiving the services and the ones delivering the services are competent in using telehealth technology. And although there aren't any requirements for telehealth training, I recommend all the staff that will be using the telehealth services to go through something similar to a telehealth one-on-one -on -one course, either in-house or through external trainers. Um, in addition, you have to develop your own training procedures for your own practice to ensure that your uh, staff are competent in delivering telehealth uh, in your service model. The training could include things like how to set up the lighting, the background, the clothes you wear, how to set up the camera, um, so you make sure that you're trying to have eye contact, make sure, making sure you identify everyone participating, having emergency plans, um, training on telemedicine documentation, training on billing, and just general technology use, among many other areas. Uh, at Children's, we've recently revamped our training, and this includes three components, uh, especially for our mental health providers. We have to complete a 30-minute technology training, a didactic portion similar to a Telehealth 101 with the components I just mentioned. And we also have a, an observation of a trained telehealth provider in our area or a telehealth train, uh, provider has to observe you during your first visit. So of course, one of the major differences between research and practice is funding source. So with a grant, you have a preset amount of money, and in practice, you have to deliver services to gain funds or obtain contracts. Uh, third party payers often restrict the type of services that can be provided, um, and this depends on whether it's private or public. Um, they can restrict whether telehealth can be done at all or who can deliver telehealth, um, and there's often limits to the service. So 
For example, although research has shown that behavior analysts can effectively coach parents to implement assessment and intervention in the home, insurance companies do not often cover this type of service. And to my knowledge, we're one of the only teams that has been able to translate the in-home telehealth model for severe challenging behavior conducted in Iowa into a sustainable fee-for-service practice. And this just happened five months ago, and the research has been being done since for 10 years. My tip for uh, funding in practice would be to uh, make sure what you're doing is reimbursable as best you can and to run a small pilot to evaluate reimbursement before you invest too much into the program. So one of the tasks that is very daunting for providers is selecting the technology. I always get questions about technology. And of course, one of the most important aspects is maintaining client confidentiality in both research and practice. And you know that um, different bodies regulate how confidentiality and privacy are maintained. Um, and their first selection of technology may be a little different in research and practice. Um, and we just must ensure that security measures are in place to protect data and the information of our client. And we also need to inform our clients of the different risks and confidentiality through telehealth. Um, another thing is that new technology emerges all the time and practitioners are not expected to keep up with these developments but they are expected to receive consultation to ensure that the technology both hardware and software they're using meets HIPAA security requirements and quality and uh, your local telehealth research centers are very helpful in this regard I strongly recommend that if you're pursuing telehealth um, you reach out to your local TRC I did that in Virginia and um, they were extremely helpful so finally um, you don't only want to ensure that your technology is secure, but it has to be high quality. Poor quality technology results in missed frames and dropped calls, and our observations will be of poor quality. So you have to ensure that you can observe the behavior you're targeting accurately. So if you're targeting uh, some kid that's uh, engaging in self-injury and you are dropping frames and you cannot observe that, then you can't run effective services. So having high quality technology does not mean buying the most expensive technology. It just means using technology that um, will enable you to seamlessly conduct your sessions and observe all the behaviors that you're targeting. So two final considerations that you should address before starting your practice. One is calling your liability insurance carrier to make sure that they cover telehealth, especially if, in your, if you're in private practice. And finally, you just need a, an additional informed consent procedure or embedding it within your regular consent procedure when starting telehealth. Okay, so to finish today, I'd like to talk about some of the lessons learned integrating telehealth into a hospital model. And for our in-home project, we had a wonderful team of folks that were behind the scenes helping integrate telehealth into our workflow. So I asked our hospital's telehealth program manager, Sarah Orr, to send me some lessons learned from their end about integrating telehealth into our system. And here are some of the lessons learned from their team. So our team recommends thinking of this as launching an entire new virtual clinic. You need more than just video conference to, uh, for the connection to be successful. First, you need to define the current state workflows and the ideal future state telemedicine workflows as closely together as possible. This means, they said, building processes around the ideal future states for the providers, trying to not change as much as possible from the current state in-person workflows, and building workflows for supporting operational areas like scheduling and patient screening. Um, she also recommended building backups to your backups. So first, ensuring providers and clinic support staff know what the backup plan is, um, if there's any failure at any point. So, um, so we have that clearly outlined for us. And also defining the process for reporting issues and making that e as easy as possible. And they were highly responsive when we reported, so they, they definitely reinforced uh, reporting any issues. We also recommend designing the technology around the people, not the people around the technology. So our team just made it work for us. Um, if providers work primarily out of their EMR, then integrate telehealth into their EMR. Um, in addition, our team worked to allow providers to use any hardware that they were familiar with, like I mentioned, and they were comfortable with. And this was actually uh, very helpful for, as I mentioned, for um, our service modality. 
And our team also recommends uh, having IT support available for the first handful of visits for each provider. And this was actually very helpful um, for our less tacky uh, tech savvy providers and made them a little bit more brave about um, going into telehealth. During trainer, they, the training, they also recommend having providers simulate visits with each other, taking turns for acting as a patient. Um, they feel that it is very important for us to experience as providers what the patients will be experiencing. And this was a, actually a very, very fun day at the Autism Center when we could actually see all their team's hard work come into fruition. And um, we also did simulations with um, one of our patients that day who was just over the moon about uh, being able to deliver or get services in, in her home. So our team watched uh, a few of our first few visits from end to end carefully in the background and they were available in the building next door um, for any consultation. Some of the things they looked for was making sure patients were accessing the telehealth platform successfully or that they had the help they needed, ensuring that we as providers were launching the video visits the way um, we, it was designed um, and it was fitting into our workflow and our schedule. And they were immediately checking billing and claims to make sure everything was going as expected. So we've also worked very hard on decreasing the effort for our patients in this process because as we know, the barriers for entry are too high, they just won't use it, or we'll schedule the visit and the parent won't show. Um, finally, we recommend assuring our patients uh, and families that we can offer the same level of care, and sometimes better, um, and we can provide the same benefits uh, through telehealth um, instead of in-person visits. So I think that's... Hi, this is Deb again. I want to thank Dr. Padilla Dalmau for her excellent presentation today. For those of you that might need to drop off, just a reminder that this is being recorded um, and we will answer all questions um, and that will be part of the recording. Just a quick note, um, our next webinar will actually not occur on the third Thursday of October, but instead on the second Wednesday. So on October 10th, we'll have a presentation from Indiana University School of Medicine, Project ECHO, Telementoring Program for the Treatment of Opioid Use Disorder. Um, that will be sponsored by the Upper Midwest TRC. Registration will be out soon. And then at the end, after the, sur uh, after the conference is over, you will receive an online survey. We value your opinion and hope that you will um, complete that for us. Uh, and now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Padilla Delmo for Q&A. So I'll, I'll help with the Q&A as well. And um, first off, Dr. Delmo, um, a lot of people have said your presentation was great and they would love to have a copy of your presentation if available um, so we can work with you on that. And then another thing I'd like to mention is I do see in the Q&A there's a lot of questions regarding policy and technology. And so one thing that I encourage you guys to do is definitely look at your the Telehealth Resource Center. Um, we have the Center for Connected Health Policy, which is a great resource for questions regarding specific reimbursement or policy mm -hmm. questions, but also please reach out to your TRC and you can ask those specific questions. And then Regarding technology questions, we, we are to remain vendor neutral. So one thing to, to also do is reach out to the technology, the National Technology Assessment Center for questions, more specific questions about technology because they can give you some vendor neutral answers regarding technology. So the first question um, is, is there a place to view a recording of this presentation? So the answer is yes, following this webinar, we will have a recording posted on the National Telehealth Resource Center, and that is telehealthresourcecenter.org. And um, this question is, what provider types of billing for telemedicine services? So is it only under the psychiatrist or are the BCBAs allowed to bill for telehealth? Um, yeah, so this Right now we're billing under our psychotherapy codes, uh, under 
um, our psychology licenses. Um, when I was in Virginia, I built under my uh, BCBA license. Um, so as behavior analysts, we typically can bill for supervision remotely and also in some cases, parent coaching and parent training. Um, so right now our model is psychotherapy because that's our billing structure right now. But we are looking into our master's, master's level clinicians who were recently licensed in the state being credentialed to also deliver telehealth um, when they're billing. So yeah, that's both of those are viable models, but it depends on the third party payer. It depends on your state. It depends on various things. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then we have another question where they are attempting to use telehealth in practice much more often from both an assessment and an intervention perspective. So it often seems that parents are disappointed when offered this option instead of having their team travel the distance to their home. So how do you manage that? If you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I've had some of the families right now. So that goes to the last point I said, trying to assuage families. So the first thing I do is talk about my experience, the research, what we've been able to do. And because our model is parent coaching in person, I just tell them, you know, in person, I'll be in the next door room through telehealth. I just will be in another room, but you'll be at home. So I try to focus on the benefits and also on their research backing. Um, however, it is a little bit more tricky when you are trying to translate behavior technician time in the home for ABA models to only parent coaching. So if there's a loss of hours, parents will definitely have concerns. So, um, so when I, when I did this model in Virginia, the parents remained with their behavior technician hours in person for the comprehensive model, and I just provided my supervision remotely. Um, so you, you have to make sure that the quality of services you're delivering through telehealth is the same or better than what you're doing in person in order for families not to uh, feel like they're missing out on something. Um, we actually have had some families not want to do telehealth with our psychiatrists because they have so many years of experience with them that they just want to come visit them in person. <laughs> so, um, so it really is a parent preference and we always lead with what is your preference and we try to give them the data, but it's, it really is the modality that they, they would prefer. Um, All right, thank you. So what's your experience with Medicare covering telehealth? So this person's a BCBA at a non nonprofit county in Washington, and these are their primary clients. So is this for adults or children? Can the it person answer? It didn't specify, what? yeah. If this person could respond in the chat, or excuse me, in the Q&A, then we can go back to your question. I can speak to Medicaid um, because for children here, and we are um, we're getting reimbursed for our um, psychoth psychotherapy codes equally. Um, when I did this in Virginia, it was under Tricare because it was a military base, and we were getting reimbursed equally than in person as well. Um, but I don't have any specific information about Medicare, but I can get more information from our, our telehealth team. Okay, sounds great. And then we've been attempting to use telehealth in practice much more often from both an assessment and intervention. Oh, we've already gone over that one. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> and then this person's an ABA provider. Is there a way to connect to you so she could have or this person could have your resources to discuss for this? Yes. Definitely. I would love that. I see that the ABA providers in Wenatchee it's one of the areas that I um, engage in with the most. So I'd be happy to share my email um, to discuss support and resources. Perfect, thank you. And is parent equipment covered by medical costs? So does the insurance pay for in-home equipment? So that's where we are, st so we're starting to try to figure out how to do an equi equitable service for families who are lower income and do not have access to hardware and internet. Similarly, that when we did research, we just could send them the equipment, right? So there was equitable care for all of our families. And I ha we have just started this, so I don't know what our 
funding streams could be for for doing this but it you know i don't think we'll stop until the service is equitable so in a few months we may have some answers about um how are we funding uh, a checkout system for families um the first thing was a nonprofit kind of donations that's what we're going to try first but um it would make sense that uh Medicaid maybe would cover it. I'm not sure. Um, do you guys know, Deb or Shannon, do you have any knowledge of whether uh, insurance companies pay for telehealth equipment? There may be a few, but I think it's pretty rare. It, you'd have to really check so on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that would have to be a policy kind of thing and advocacy that um, would have to happen. All right, and then somebody left a comment that Medicaid does pay for ABA telehealth under the parent training code. Yep, All right, they do. So, and well, Ellen just, Silver said that Medicaid does not pay for equipment. Thanks, Ellen. And then it looks like um, you mentioned that you bill for telehealth via psychotherapy codes. So do you also bill your in-person visits as psychotherapy? Um, At our site yes. room, okay. So they bill under adaptive behavior treatment, which is not covered. Yeah, I'd have to, we'd have to sit down and talk about what codes those are um, and just look at rules and regulations. Um, or use your TRC, they're very helpful. <laughs> But yeah, we do build psychotherapy codes in person. I'm gonna keep this open for a few more seconds to see if we have any okay. more questions come in. And did you ask the um, question, um, a, a person asked about if Skype was HIPAA compliant for telehealth? No, I didn't ask that one. Should I field that one? If you'd like, or, or I could, if you want. I can say, so we use Skype for research and we just had, that's something I didn't mention, but I typically do. So for research, we use Skype and we just had you know, it passed through IRB and we just have parents sign consent forms, um, but it is not ideal to use it for fee for service and uh, telehealth services. Um, so what would be your opinion, Deb? Well, I think um, there is a version of Skype, Skype for business um, for which you can sign a BAA. And in that case, it could be compliant for telehealth. Otherwise, and that you had that in your slides that if you're going to be doing telehealth to the home, having a product that where they're willing to sign a business associates agreement is or the first step to determine if they're HIPAA compliant. Right, right. I didn't know that about Skype. That's good to know. That's why I always ask TRC's questions. <laughs> Well, I think it looks like um, there are no open questions. Thank you once again, Dr. Padillo Dalmo. It was an excellent presentation. Um, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you to the audience for participating today.